Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Scott Healy. I'm the Vice President and the Chair of the, the Ways and Means Committee for the Friends of the Canadian uh, War Museum. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, second uh, edition of our uh, Friends Forum virtually, which will feature uh, Jean-Pierre Raymond's uh, Part 2 story uh, reflecting the, uh, the accomplishments of a very well-known French-Canadian engineering family. As you can tell, it looks like Jean-Pierre has changed uniforms uh, and he will be able to, uh, to articulate why he has done so. So on behalf of uh, Louis Sou, who is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the chair of uh, the Friends Forums, I'd like to welcome you all and uh, do enjoy to, you know, this, you know, this evening's uh, uh, you know, talk and uh, and uh, over to you, uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, please start your presentation and let's hear a little bit more about this uh, uh, very well-known family in some circles, not all, and see how their contribution to the second, uh, for First World War uh, made such a difference for the engineering aspects uh, of that campaign. Jean-Pierre, over to you. Thank you, I'll uh, welcome everybody. Uh... Uh, I am wearing tonight the uniform of a Royal Engineer uh, of the War of 1812. I use that uh, uniform to portray the Canadian-born engineer, Ralph Henri Bruyère. But uh, we'll come to that uh, a bit later. Uh, I have to go in my... Uh, Ah, here it is. Um, okay, last time we talked about uh, Gaspard Joseph Chose Gros de Liri. Whoops, I lost my presentation. Um, and um, And uh, we talk about uh, Gaspar Joseph Chose Gros de Liri was the, uh, uh, the chief engineer of Canada, and as such built quite a lot of things as I've shown you last time. And, and, and the most important one are the Quebec ramparts that still exist today. And we talk a bit about the son, Joseph Gaspar Chose Gros de Liri, and his uh, son-in-law, Michel Chartier de Lotbinière will become an engineer. And um, the, um, and we, we stop with them at the, uh, at the uh, when they get, came back to Canada in, in 1763. And uh, tonight we'll take on from there. Um, starting with uh, Michel Chartier de la Dunière, he had uh, three siblings, of which one is important for us, and it's uh, Michel Eustache Gaspard Alain Chartier de la Dunière, that in short I call Mega, and he was uh, uh, in the artillery. And uh, we have here uh, a portrait of him with his second wife, Mary Charlotte Monroe de Follis. He was born in Quebec in uh, 1748. In 1759, he is an artillery officer in the French army during the siege of Quebec at 11 years old. In 1760, he is with the French army that surrendered in Montreal and he is deported to France like his father because he also owned a King's Commission. In 1763, he is back to Canada with his father that is now the province of Quebec. And he is one of the Canadians who voluntarily will become Quebecer and he started his studies to become a priest like his grandfather. In 1770, his father get bankrupt and his mother will get him out of the study and have him married, uh, Marie-Josette Godfroy de Tonancourt, who got quite an impressive dowry that uh, had him buy back the, the Seigneury of La Binière. In uh, 1771, with some friends, is going to buy back the property of Vaudreuil, Rigaud, and Nouvelle-Beauce, but 
it was a bit uh, too much for his uh, finances and he's going to sell Nouvelle Beauce to his uncle, uh, Joseph Gaspard Chaux Groot In 1775, he is now an artillery officer in the British Army, defending Fort Saint-Jean sur Richelieu, uh, built by his uncle, and th that is now the site of the Collège Militaire Royal de Saint-Jean. He was taken prisoner and brought to Philadelphia, to Pennsylvania, where he met uh, William Began, the richest man of New England and future president of that state Congress. And they promised that their children are going to get married. He returned to Canada in a prisoner exchange and on his way will visit his father that is in Boston, uh, sent by the French government to support the American rebellion with his uh, knowledge of how to manufacture gun. When uh, Mega arrive in Canada, Carleton is very happy of his return and he is promoted captain and as assigned uh, to, um, uh, on his staff. In, in 1792, he is elected at the Legislative Assembly of Lower Canada and is involved in the language debate. We have a, a, here a picture of the National, Assembly Nationale du Québec and above the president uh, chair, you have a fresque that uh, you see more in detail here. And a member of, part of the Legislative Assembly uh, proposed that uh, to be heard and understood by the king, they have to use the king's language. Uh, Pierre Stanislas Bedard, the guy we see uh, in the back in the, with a brown coat, will uh, reply that if that was the case, the parliament in London should have speak German when King George I went on the throne. But uh, Mega, uh, rise up, raise his hand, and that's him who is uh, having the, the arm to pointing the ceiling. And he's going to declare, remember 1775. It is a Francophone subject of this province who defended it against the invader. Remember also that the invader were Anglophone subject of his majesty that were traitors. And see what's going on in France. It is a Francophone subject of, the, the, uh, of his majesty who have assassinated him. On the contrary, his majesty will find great pride to show people who are uh, faithful to him, whatever the language they were using. And he won his case and the uh, speak French in Parliament. In 1798, his father died in New York in a yellow fever epidemic. His, uh, he is buried next to the uh, common ground actually used for COVID. And uh, Mega will inherit the title of Marquis de France that his father got in 1784. In 1799, his wife died with no children in 29 years of marriage. In 1802, he remarried with Marie Charlotte Monroe de Paulus, the daughter of a member of the Legislative Assembly of Upper Canada, and he's going to have six children, of which three daughters will reach adult adulthood. The first is Louise Joseph, who was supposed to marry uh, the American, but uh, she fell in love with Colonel Robert on Wynne Harwood, and her mother agreed with her, and she'll become the singeress of Vaudreuil. The second is Marie Charlotte, who will end up with the American, uh, William Begam Jr., and she'll become singeress of Rigaud, and uh, they'll, she, they'll sell that uh, property. She bring uh, William in Paris, where he'll become an American in Paris, and later the, Amer the French start another French Revolution. They end up in London, where he become a very, very late loyalist. And finally, Julie Christine is going to marry the French Huguenot Gaspard Pierre Gustave Joly, and she'll become the Seigneuresse de Lodvignan. All three married in separation of goods using the Coutume de Paris law, which implied that they all keep their title of Seigneuresse, and they all have the right to vote for the Legislative Assembly of Lower Canada when they reach 25 year old, since that in the French law, a woman is a person, contrary to the uh, common law of, uh, of England. In the war of 1812, he's now a colonel and commander Vaudreuil Militia Battalion. 
In 1822, he died. He's the last officer of Montcalm to disappear. Those are the pictures of the three daughters, Louise Joseph, Marie Charlotte, and Julie Christine. And uh, then I get back to my character that I am uh, for personifying, Colonel Ralph Henri Bruyère. And you see here a Martello Tower that protect the Abraham Heights. That was about the, the type of fortification that Ludvignere wanted to build in uh, February 1759, and that Montcalm refused. It took an engineer from Montreal to do what an engineer of Quebec was unable to do. Briard is born in Montreal in, 17, in 1765. As a colonel in the regular, he is the second highest ranked Canadian in the British Army. His father, John Briard, is a British officer of Huguenot religion who will marry in Prairie River, Catherine Elizabeth Pomereau de Montesson de Croisillon, co seigneuress of Bécancourt. And because his father is a Protestant, he is accepted at the Royal Military Academy of Woolwich in London, where he completed his engineer tra training in 1782. In 1790, he is in Montreal and is going to marry Janet Dunbar, also born in Montreal. She's the daughter of Captain William Dunbar of the 43rd Foot Regiment and Thérèse Joseph Fleury de la Gorgandia de Chambeau another nice looking French Canadian lady. And as of consequence, they're both bridges between nation, which is nice for an engineer. The sister of Thérèse Joseph is Marie-Claire Fleury de la Gorgandia de Chambeau, who married Judge John Fraser of the King's Bench Court. Previously, he was an officer in the 78 foot Fraser Islander. Uh, their daughter, Joseph Fraser, will marry Charles-Jeanne Chosegros de Liri, the only son of G Joseph Gaspard who was not in the army. In 1792, he is assigned to the Duke of York Army in Flanders, facing the chief engineer of the French Republican Army, François Joseph Chosegros de Liri, who was born in Quebec. To my knowledge, that's the first playoff series between Quebec and Montreal. Uh, you have on one side the Canadian of Quebec, Chosegros de Liri, and facing him, you have the Quebecer of Montreal, uh, Ralph Henri Bruyère. And if you're mixed up in your identity, that's normal. We forgot a long time ago that the Canadian identity is a French identity and that the Quebecer identity is a British identity. In 1796, he's in Batavia, which is Holland, uh, Netherlands. In 1802, he is uh, in Upper Canada to survey Canadian defenses with General Isaac Group, which is going to help him a lot when the war is, is declared in 1812. In 1806, uh, he is chief engineer of Upper and Lower Canada and required uh, by Governor Craig to build the Martello Tower, excuse me, in Quebec City. Those are the only Martello Tower in the empire who are equipped with a roof to avoid that the water infiltrate into the masonry and create potholes. In 1812, when the war started, the Martello Tower are just being finished and he moved to Kingston, where he's going to build Fort Frederick, which is today the site of the Royal Military College of Canada. In 1813, he keep moving west and is going to build Fort Mississauga, which is north of Fort George on the shore of the Niagara River. Uh, and that's because he expected that Fort George it was to fall since Fort Niagara, built by Chosgrove Lady Father, uh, had a nine foot advantage over Fort George. And uh, in 1814, he's going to die in Quebec. Now, Joseph Gaspard Chosgrove Lady, the son of the chief engineer, had five children. You have here his portrait, and uh, you have a, a photo showing the names on the Arc de Triomphe uh, sur la Place de l'Étoile à Paris. You have uh, Lady, which is a seven from the top. And uh, that's uh, because he was one of uh, Napoleon generals during uh, the Napoleonic campaign. He is the only Canadian who got that privilege. François Joseph was trained at the Ecole Royale Génie Militaire de Mézières and graduated in 1777. 
in 17, uh, up to 1781, he was working on the uh, harbor of Brest. He was involved in the Second Battle of Wesson during the American Rebellion. In 1795, he's the chief engineer in the Sambre and Meuse Army, facing three Canadian engineers, Ralph-Henri Bruyère, uh, Gaspard Roque-Georges Chausse-Gros-Derry, and uh, Louis-René Chausse-Gros-Derry. And his aide-de-camp was uh, Alexandre André Victor Chausse-Gros-Derry, his other brother. And in Flanders, you have five Canadian engineers, and they'll be in four different armies. In 1799, he is now a brigadier general, and in 1800, he is chief engineer of the left wing of the Rhine army under General Moreau. In 1803, he is the chief engineer of the Grison army, and is involved in the Holland campaign facing Bruyère. In 1804, he is aide de camp to the emperor. In 1805, he is a general of division and of engineering and is involved in the Friedland battle. In 1810, he is chief engineer of the Midi Army in uh, Spain and he is in command of the first siege of Badajoz in 1811 and in, on the same year, the Battle of Albuera. In 1811, he is created Baron of the Empire. In, and in 1812, he is chief engineer of all the armies in Spain and Italy. But that's the year he is made chief engineer of the Grand Army who invade Russia. It's him who told Napoleon, be careful, there's a winter in Russia. And Napoleon replied to him, in France too, there is a winter. Not the same, for sure. In 1813, uh, in, in, in fact, in 1812, he's going to save the French army during the uh, Berezina crossing in winter condition. In 1813, he is in charge of the defense of Soissons during the France campaign. In 1814, he is chief engineer of France, both under Napoleon and Louis XVIII, uh, who keep him as chief engineer. Uh, you have to remember that Louis XVIII worked with the other two shows Gros Lili. You know, there's a lot of talent in that family. In 1815, he is back. Um, in fact, uh, in 1814, they sent Napoleon to take a rest in Elba Island and Louis XVIII take over and keep uh, François Joseph. But in 1815, Napoleon is back in France and he's going to get back his chief engineer and fortify the city of Lyon and Paris with great abilities. The ones in Lyon are still today in use as the command post of the nuclear strike force of France with a few engineering improvements, mostly electronics. And uh, he's going to write at the bottom of his report, the emperor have rendered useless all my work by precipitating his army in front of my defenses to have it destroyed in one shot at Waterloo. And he revered back as chief engineer of Louis XVIII, who doesn't show much rancor. He's going to have his uh, baron title replaced by the title of Viscount. And he's going to have uh, for his brother in Russia, the uh, Croix de Saint-Louis. At his death, he was in nomination for the rank of Maréchal de France. In uh, 1796, he's going to marry Cecilia Kellerman, uh, the daughter of uh, Maréchal de France, uh, Christophe Keller Kellerman. That's a list of all the admirals and generals uh, that of Canadian origin who were in Napoleon army. And here we have a picture of uh, Gaspard Roque Georges Gros de Lyrie. He was born in Quebec in 1771, sent to France in 1787 to be trained as an engineer at the Royal Engineering School in Mézières. Both he and François Joseph before uh, were a bit needed some help in mathematics to succeed, go, get through the examination to attend uh, the, the school. Uh, the, to, to be accepted in that school, they picked the 25 best uh, mark in mathematics and uh, to help them out, uh, their uncle, Michel Chartier de la Dignière, was in France or is going to help them. 
1789, he fled France and joined the Condé Armée as a lieutenant in the Corps Royal Génie. He became a preceptor. Uh, at the end of the campaign, he accepted the offer of the Polish princess Witwetinska to be the preceptor of her two daughters. To my knowledge, the first two women who have received an engineer training, of which Maria Antonovna Nerishkina Zvetvertenskaya will become the mistress of the future Tsar of Russia, Alexander I, no less. And that is how it's not only Napoleon who like nice uh, looking Pol Polonaise. And that's how the Tsar Paul I, the son of the great Catherine, Offer him to be the preceptor of, a, of his last two sons, the future Tsar Nicola I and his brother, the Grand Duke Michel, who will become the commander of the artillerist and engineer corps in Russia. He is used all that time as a liaison officer between the Tsar and the Prince de Condé, that is in Austria. In 1812, he is in St. Petersburg while his brother, as chief engineer of the Grand Army, invade Russia. And uh, he died in Grodno in Bielorussia in 1831, uh, where he was residing with the Princess Vertinska and Count Javsky, that was a friend. You have here a portrait of uh, Maria Antonovna Nirishkina Vertinskaya, painted by Louise Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun, who was a portraitist of uh, Marie Antoinette and had to flee the French Revolution and end up at the Russian court. And Count Jovsky is going to have a son, Casimir Stanislav Jovsky, that we see here in a uniform of Canadian colonel. Casimir Stanislav Jovsky, born in St. Petersburg in 1813, uh, at a time when uh, Gaspar George was in St. Petersburg, he is a son of a Polish count who is a friend of the Polish princess Vetvetinska and is a captain in the Russian Imperial Guard. Uh, Kazimierz Stanislaw will receive an engineer training in Russia. And in 1830, he is in the Polish rebellion fighting against the Russian Imperial Guard under the command of his father. He's going to flee the, the, his father, the rat, to Austria where they, that refused to hand him back to Russia and they'll exile him to New York, where he'll have to learn a fifth language. He speaks fluently French, German, Russian, and Polish. To learn the English language, he's going to follow a law course and is accepted at the New York bar. And uh, he'll get involved in railroad construction between Erie and uh, New York. And uh, with such a su success that his bus sent him on the other side of the lake at Kingston, where by accident he meet the Governor General of Canada, Sir Charles Bagot, who previously was ambassador of the United Kingdom uh, in Russia and was a great friend of his father. Once he heard the stories, he said, you young man, you're going to stay here. And he put him in charge of all public work in Ontario. And that's how he's going to pave the first street in Canada, Young Street in Toronto. He's going to build several railroads, including the railroad between Toronto and Sarnia, in the way building the first international railroad bridge between Canada and the United States. And in 1873, he's reactivated as a military engineer by the Canadian militia. And, as a, and he get the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And in 1882, he's promoted Colonel. In 1879, he's made aide de camp for His uh, Majesty Victoria. And in 1779, he's going to meet Henri Gustave Joly de la Dunière, who was Premier of Quebec. And uh, he was there to present the new Governor General of Canada, the Marquis de Lorme. As a chief engineer of the Canadian militia and as the highest ranked Canadian in the Canadian militia, he must certainly have been involved in the creation of the Royal Military College of Canada, but unfortunately, I haven't found a proof yet. In 1881, he was appointed to the uh, Adjutant General Office to the Board of Visitors to review activities at the Royal Military College of Canada. He is probably the one who convinced the first commandant, Colonel Ewitt, who was before at the Royal Military Academy of Woolwich in London, 
to uh, observe the organization of teaching in West Point, uh, that he had the chance to observe himself in 1862 during the Civil War in the United States. The main difference is that uh, the U US training is based on the French training at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, where the ratio of student per teacher is much lower than what is uh, done elsewhere. In addition, he convinced Ewitt that the training provided should be a civil engineering training instead of a military engineering training. Even Lord Kitchener, an engineer himself, recognized the superior superiority of the Canadian engineering training for most of the engineering requirements of a modern army. Here we have a nice picture. If you look at the people seated from the left, you have the Marquis de Lorme, Governor General of Canada. Next to him is Colonel Jovsky, is aide de camp. Next to him is uh, Princess Louise, uh, the wife of uh, Marquis de Lorme. And next to her is uh, Marie Bibi, the wife of Jovsky, which is a daughter of a doctor in Cleveland. And I suspect that her family name, in fact, was Babi, but it was uh, transformed by the American. And you have, um, if I remember, that's uh, Louis René Chose Gros Derry. He was an officer in the uh, Condé army and he uh, will exile himself to the United Kingdom, get back to Canada to replace his father as a landowner. And at the War of 1812, he is one of the most experienced officers in North America. And this time, the British don't refuse him because he is Catholic. And he's uh, a lieutenant colonel and will finish the war a colonel. The other brother is Alexandre André Victor Chose Uh He was a uh, aide de camp to his brother in Flanders. Uh, he is uh, involved in the siege of Badajoz. And he'll end up uh, chief engineer of Guadeloupe, which is the country that Louis XV kept in place of Canada. And he's going to meet uh, the architect Arsène Lacarrière Latour, which will become the chief engineer of Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. And uh, Charles Eugène, uh, Charles, yeah, Charles Eugène uh, was born in Quebec in 1774. He is trained as a lawyer and going to marry Joseph Fraser, the daughter of Judge John Fraser. And during the War of 1812, he served as a deputy quartermaster general with the rank of major, and is promoted to lieutenant colonel and become deputy adjutant general in the militia. He was named at the executive council in 1826 and to the special council that governed the Lower Canada after the Lower Canada Rebellion of 1838. Next is Sir Henri Gustave Joly de Lutbinière. Uh, on the right, you have a photo of him with his family. He is uh, on the far uh, right in the picture, in the middle, seated, and his wife is uh, not far from him on the right. And uh, the seven kids are all there. And uh, you see on the right a uh, photo of him in his uh, Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. Uh, and uh, since uh, Henri Gustave was born in France, during the honeymoon of his parents, from a father that is a Protestant. He is today the only prime minister of Quebec, was not Catholic and uh, was not born in Canada. And in British Columbia, he is still today the only Francophone to be Lieutenant Governor and the only one who was not coming from British Columbia. And he's the last lieutenant governor in Canada to have fired a, prior, a premier, which incidentally was a premier of the Liberal Party. And he put in this place a premier of the Conservative Party while he was himself a minister in the Liberal Party of uh, Wilfrid Laurier. Henri Gustave is the great grandson of Michel Chartier de Lodinière and the son of Julie Christine Chartier de Lodinière. 
His brother, Edmond, uh, was a captain who fought in Crimea and in India, where he got killed in the Lucknow battle during the Indian uprising. His sister, Emilie Ursule Joly, married uh, Henry Savage, George Savage, who was a British officer. He was trained as a lawyer in France. He's going to marry Margareta Josepha Gowen in Quebec. She was born in Quebec from a mother, uh, Margareta Josepha Ireland, that is also born in Quebec. He is the founder of the Parti Libéral du Québec. He'll become a premier of Quebec in 1878-79 and is a lieutenant governor of British Columbia in 1900 to 1906. He had seven children who reached adulthood. One boy will become a lawyer like his father, and the other two will become engineers and are generals in the First World War. The four girls will marry engineers, of which one is a general in World War I. We are here the photograph of uh, Alain Chartier de Lodbinière, Jolie de Lodbinière. If you wonder how come he have de Lodbinière twice in his name, it's because when he, he was Baptist, uh, de Lodbinière was in his first name. But in 1888, when his grandmother died, uh, Julie Christine Chartier de Lodbinière, Henri Gustave got a private bill in Quebec to change his family name from Jolie to Jolie de Lodbinière. Consequently, the poor kid ended up with de Lodbinière twice in his name. The picture on the left is him as a second lieutenant, and on the right, it's in his uniform of a major general. If we start with the first kid, uh, it's Julia Josepha, who's going to marry St. George Boswell, the chief engineer of Quebec Harbor. He'll never go to a rope because the job in Quebec is uh, too, too uh, critical for the war effort of Canada. But his son, Hugh Brabazon Boswell, will be an engineer in World War I and a brigadier general in World War II. His uh, daughter will marry uh, Sir Harold Fortescue Flannery, who is an engineer and was a captain with the Royal Horse Artillery in World War I. Their son, John Derek Fortescue, uh, will be a fighter pilot who got killed in World War II. Edmond Gustave will become a lawyer like his father from the University Bishop and will succeed his father as a Seigneur de la Dignière. And his son, Alain Joly, will be a captain with the Black Watch. He was trained as a forestry engineer at the University of Toronto. Uh, in that family, they have a, a, a way of doing with the forest is that you don't cut the forest faster than it grow. As a consequence, the uh, forest of Lodbinière still exists today. It's the only private seigneury who still got a forest. And um, Alain, the third son is Alain Chartier that we saw the, the picture. He's going to marry Marianne Ellen Campbell, the daughter of a colonel in Kingston that he nicknamed She Cerise. And that come from uh, when you call your wife Chéri, <clears throat> it sounds like cherry. And in French, Chéri is Cerise. In the Australian history of uh, at the First World War, his name is Alain C. de L. Joly de Lodbinière. <clears throat> and in the index, you have to go in Joly. Um, he's uh, going to, um, we'll see his story later, but he have a son, uh, Henri Alain, that would be a, a major, a Royal Engineer major in World War I and a Brigadier General in World War II. He's going to marry a nurse from World War I. And their son, Alain, Anthony Alain, will be a captain in the Irish Guard in World War II. You, you, if you remember uh, a bridge too far, that's the regiment was at the point of the 30th Corps. Uh, Alain was born in uh, Quebec in 1862. He graduated from Royal Military College number 69, one of the first French Canadian graduate from the Royal Military College. He worked two years with Canadian Pacific Railroad but in 1885, uh, following a crisis with the Russian in Afghanistan, he is recruited by the Royal Engineer. 
in 1887 is uh, at the Indian Military War Department, and there is going to build, among other things, the lighthouse of the Arbor of Karachi. In 1898, he is now a captain instructor of mechanical engineering in the UK. In 1899, he returned to Missouri, India as deputy chief engineer and will build the hydroelectric dam on the Chauvry River with the longest transmission line in the world. 1911, he is promoted Lieutenant Colonel. In 1913, he is chief engineer of Bengal. But in 1914, he is picked by General Birdwood to be a chief engineer of the Anzac Corps. And in 1915, uh, they land in Gallipoli and is promoted Brigadier General. The three main tasks he'll have to tackle are, you land 60,000 men without water. Fortunately, the Turks sunk quite a lot of ships and he, uh, he was able to uh, recover quite a few uh, pumps and boiler engine and created a pump house. And he built an underground uh, tank of 70,000 gallon under a crest, which allowed to feed all the troops by gravity. At the end of 1915, he succeeded with his brother, that is the chief engineer of the British A Corps in Ells Point, to ex extirpate their respective corps from Gallipoli without losses <clears throat> and are transferred to France where they joined their brother-in-law, uh, General Herbert Colborn Nanton, who is the chief engineer of the Indian Corps. And uh, when they find out that the Indians are more susceptible to the German, uh, to the French climate than to the German bullets, they are transferred to Palestine, where they, they are left with only the German bullet. And Nanton, they told him, not you, you're a Canadian, you're used to that climate. And he's going to be the chief engineer of the British Third Army and at the end will be uh, chief engineer of the British 15th Army, uh, seven, uh, 15 Corps, and then 17 Corps. In any case, uh, when the, the Australian decide to get rid of all the, office, the general officer who were not from Australia, he is uh, moved to U the UK to command the Eastern Command as a major general. <clears throat> and in 1919, he retired. The fourth kid in the family is Margareta Anna Jolie de Lodinière, who is going to marry Herbert Carbon Nantun, also a graduate of the Royal Military College and is a great friend of Alain. And uh, the fifth uh, sibling is uh, Mathilde Florence Jolie de Lodinière, who is going to marry uh, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Smith Greenwood, <laughs> another royal engineer attached to the British Expeditionary Force headquarters. He's going to die of disease in 1916, just after the Battle of the Somme. His son, Eric Henri de Lodinier Greenwood, will uh, die in 1977 in Dorval. <coughs> he was a major in the Royal Engineer during the World, First World War. <coughs> Sorry. And he, but he lose a leg in France and become an instructor in France at the Royal Military College and at McGill University. <laughs> His uh, brother, Harold de la Vigna Greenwood, will be a Brigadier General in the Second World War. He was a, a Royal Engineer in the First World War. The sixth one is Henri Gustave Joly de la Vigna's son, who is also a graduate of the Royal Military College of Canada and is a Brigadier General in the British A Corps. He did, he, he, it's him and his uh, unit who did all the tunnels for the British troop to get close to the German line for the Somme offensive. Unfortunately, his commanding officer, sure that the artillery had obliterated all German defenses, required that his soldiers will walk in the no man's land and get to the German line exposed. 20,000 uh, soldiers killed on that first day of the sun. And uh, the A Corps will be put aside and never be exposed to another uh, action. 
but the engineer of uh, Henri Gustave will be used to dig the tunnels that the Canadian Corps are going to use in Vimy. And we're not going to let our guy walk in no man's land. <clears throat> and the son of Henri Gustave is Edmond Joly, that was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Engineer, Second World War. And the last uh, sibling is Etel Blanche Joly de Rodinia, who's going to marry Dudley Ackland Mills, uh, also a graduate of the Royal Military College, was a captain in the Royal Engineer in World War I, but he died before the start of World War II. And then we switch to the cousin of Henri Gustave, which is Henriette Cordelie de Lodbinière Harwood. She'll become the second wife of Charles Etienne Panet, the minister of militia. <clears throat> and her first son is Colonel Antoine Chartier de Lodbinière Panet, trained at the University of Ottawa, uh, involved in the celebration of the 300th anniversary of Quebec. And uh, the most important fact is that he uh, wrote a devastating report against the Ross rifle in favor of the Lee Enfield rifle. That explains how come he, he didn't finish the war a general. Uh, in 1914, he is in charge of the creation of the Vicartier camp and the equipment of the 1st Canadian Division. In 1915, he is in charge of the creation of a camp at the exhibition ground in Toronto and uh, to equip the 2nd Canadian uh, Division. In 1915, he is still promoted colonel and create uh, camps in Niagara on the lake and in Borden. <clears throat> his son, Major Antoine Panet, and his uh, grandson, Lieutenant Antoine Panet, uh, I haven't found what they've done in the Second World War. The second son of Henriette Cordelie is Brigadier General Alphonse Eugène de Lodinier Panet, who's going to marry Corinne Terchereau. That's the daughter of the Chief Justice of Canada. And uh, he is a graduate of the University of Ottawa and the Royal Military College. And uh, will be a Royal Engineer in India. Will do campaign in Vaziristan, a name known for those who fought in Afghanistan. And in 1916, he is promoted Lieutenant Colonel, Chief Engineer of the 30th uh, British Division on La Somme. And in 1917, he is promoted uh, Brigadier General, Chief Engineer of the 2nd Anzac Corps. And in 1919, he became the chief engineer of the Lahore Division and Norton Command in India. His son is Brigadier General Henri de Lodinier Panet. The third uh, son of uh, Henriette Cordelie is Major General Henri Alexandre de Lodinier Panet. He will be uh, an officer on the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment in South Africa and was involved in the Battle of Par de, ba de Berg. He is promoted captain and in charge of the second contingent uh, artillery for the siege of Mafeking. After the Battle of Mafeking, he's going to have dinner with Colonel Baden Powell, the creator of the scout, scout movement. He returned to Canada to receive a DSO and appointed as instructor at the Royal Military College. 1904, he is Assistant Adjutant General. In 1911, he is presented to King George V and promoted Lieutenant Colonel Royal Canadian Horse Artillery Brigade and uh, is teaching at the Artillery School. In 1914, the Royal Canadian Artillery uh, Horse Artillery is sent to France with the 1st Canadian Division. In 1916, he is promoted Brigadier General and is in charge of the 2nd Division Artillery. In 1921, he is a Major General, Adjutant General at the Ottawa Headquarters. And in 1930, he retired. And uh, the fourth one was Charles Louis. Uh, he was a secretary of the militia department and uh, honorary colonel for the Princess Louise Dragoon Guard. And his son is surprisingly, uh, his name is Delat Binière Arwood McDonald and his family name Panet. 
You imagine a cadet who arrived at the Royal Military College with such a first name, De Lot Binière Harwood MacDonald. And he was nicknamed De Lot. And he's going to be in command of the 4th Medium Artillery Regiment uh, during the Second World War. Uh, that's the, the only medium artillery French Canadian regiment. And the fifth uh, son is Colonel Arthur Hubert, uh, that was injured during the Halifax explosion. He is with the ordnance. And the last one is not a descendant of Charles Grundy, but is uh, is worth to, to mention. He is a half brother of the other five. His mother is Caroline Angelique Lefebvre de Bellefeuille, the third wife of Charles Etienne Panet. And he'll become a major general, uh, born in, in Ottawa in 1881. He is a graduate of University of Ottawa and the Royal Military College. And in 1904, he's a captain. In 1906, uh, he go on an artillery course at Woolwich. In 1907, he became an instruct, artillery instructor in Kingston. 1911, he is a major and go to a staff course at Camberley. That's, to my knowledge, the only Canadian who attended the staff course before the First World War. <clears throat> in 1914, he became deputy ad assistant adjutant general at Quarter First Division. In 1916, he became the deputy quartermaster general of the Headquarter Fourth Division. In 1917, he is a general staff officer, first class for the 4th Division. And in 1919, he is brigadier general, deputy assist adjutant and quartermaster general in the Corps, uh, Canadian Corps headquarters. And in 1919, he resigned from the Army, become aide-de-camp to the Governor General of Canada, will be aide-de-camp to uh, during the visit of the Prince of Wales, Edward, and uh, in 1939, he's responsible for the internment camp in Canada. And in 1940, he's Major General in command of the 4th District of Montreal. 1943, he retired. And we have uh, two more. Uh, they are doctors. Dr. Louis de Lodinier Harwood and his cousin, uh, Dr. Réginal de Lodinier Harwood. Uh, Louis is the son of Henri Stanislas Chartier de Lodinier Harwood and jo Josephine Brownais. He is the grandson of Louis Joseph de Chartier de Lodinier, Seigneuress of Vaudreuil. Born in Vaudreuil, trained at the University Laval in Montreal in medicine. He is the first gynecologist uh, in Quebec. Uh, he resides at the Notre Dame Hospital. In 1903, he studied, he studied a gynecologist uh, specialty in Bro Brocaille Hospital in Paris. 1905, become director of gynecology at the University Laval in Montreal. 1906, he is superintendent of Notre Dame Hospital. In 1916, he is a colonel and president of the community for the University General Hospital Number no. 6, D. Laval. And as a consequence, we'll end up officier de la Légion d'honneur because our uh, minister of the militia didn't want to have a francophone unit in his army. And, uh, and while he was forced with the 22nd uh, French Canadian Battalion for the hospital, he is, he, he uh, hold his ground and they were uh, lent to France. And that's why they were decorated officer of the Légion d'honneur. In 1918, he's dean of the medicine faculty of the University Laval in Montreal, and will create a physics, chemi chemistry, natural science training uh, to prepare doctors uh, in their training. <clears throat> and that's for the same problem that we have with engineering, the classical uh, training uh, given in uh, high school is not appropriate for scientific uh, trade. And they need uh, to have a year of preparation to prepare them at the Royal Military College uh, to get a higher rate of francophone uh, getting through the course. They create Saint-Jean in which they'll uh, add one more year to prepare the cadet for the uh, four-year training of uh, Kingston. 
and finally he died in Montreal in 1934. And uh, Reginald is the son of Robert William de la Dignière Harwood and Mary Charlotte McGillis. He is the grandson of Colonel Robert Onwin Harwood and Marie Joseph Chartier de la Dignière, Seigneuress of Vaudreuil. Uh, he is, uh, he married Catherine Delphine MacDonald, that's the daughter, uh, daughter of uh, General MacDonald. And he is born in Vaudreuil. Uh, he is also a graduate of the University of Laval in Montreal in medicine, <coughs> will practice in Calgary and uh, create a regiment that uh, is going to create a regiment in uh, Alberta. And uh, they quickly say that he doesn't have an uh, infantry training, but since he is a doctor, he was assigned to General Hospital Number no. Eight, that is also a Francophone hospital, and also was uh, lent to France uh, as a chief surgeon and later as a chief doctor, and uh, with the rank of uh, colonel, uh, of lieutenant colonel. And uh, he also received the Legion d'Honneur. And uh, since uh, their cousin Alain Chartier de la Dignière, Jolie de la Dignière. He is also awarded the uh, Officier de la Légion d'Honneur, uh, the two uh, Lodinier Harwood brother, uh, cousin will change their name and they're uh, described as Reginald, uh, the Reginald Harwood de Lodinier instead of Reginald de Lodinier Harwood. And at the end of the war, he'll return to Alberta and later move to Vancouver. And that's it for uh, tonight. Uh, it's been quite uh, uh, not obvious to get that in uh, that short a time, but I suspect I succeeded get the job done. I tried to find out how to get that out of my way. Now, I suppose you have tons of questions. I'm just going to jump in and say, if anybody has questions, use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and uh, I'll, I'll recognize you and then you can turn your audio on and ask your question, if that's okay with you. While you're thinking about it, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to, to take my privilege and go first. You mentioned uh, one of, one of the uh, uh, folks uh, who, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to, follow this. Oh, yes. Okay. In 1787, he was sent to France to the Royal Engineering School in Mezieres. In 1787, as as Quebec was, was British, how would he end up going to France for engineering training instead of, instead of Britain? He and his brothers all went to, to become engineers like their father, their grandfather, their great-grandfather, their uncle, their great uncle, and so on. But they were all refused one by one at the Royal Military Academy of Woolwich in London because they were Catholic. Oh, which, for greatly, heavens. which greatly upset the governor, uh, Guy Carleton, who write in his journal, they were willing to fight for King George and instead we sent them fight for King Louis. What a waste of talent. Amazing how times have changed. Thank you very well, Bruyère, much. Well, Bruyère was accepted because his father is a Ignat. Yeah, yeah. But there's an exception. It's um, Charles Eugène de Rumberi de Salaberry, the brother of Charles Michel, who uh, had as a godfather the Duke of Kent and as a... The, and his wife, uh, Madame, not wife, his mistress, Madame de Saint Laurent. And because of that, he was pushed through to get to Woolwich. And when he got, the, uh, when he graduated, he went absolutely to go in Spain. And will be in the Duke of uh, Wellington army. And during the second siege of Badajoz, Fortified by François Joseph Chose Gros de Lille, he, he got killed in the in the assault. Uh, we suspect it could be a friendly fire. 
Huh. That that's one one loss that triggered the the uh, the heel the here. Uh, how do you call that? Uh, Wellington was not happy with that. Interesting. Uh, Marilyn, I see your hand up. Uh, if you unmute, unmute. Pardon me. If you unmute yourself, go ahead and ask your question. There we go. I don't have a camera. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. I found that very interesting, having grown up in Montreal, and it's just very interesting to me. Uh, I am curious about the painting you showed us of the in the National Assembly, and there was an overturned chair and papers on the floor, and I wondered if you could tell us a little more about what the painting was representing. Well, it was arguing quite loudly about uh, the capacity to use French in the debate. Uh, uh, okay. he, he, he just got elected um, Antoine Panet, uh, who will be the president for the first, uh, the, the first president of the uh, Legislative Assembly. And he was unilingual francophone. And some member of the uh, Legislative Assembly were furious of that, and they wanted that we required that only English language be used in the assembly, which would have uh, make uh, Antoine in in trouble, and uh, uh, it didn't work. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I have a second question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you have uh, followed the family heritage to this day. Uh, I know there are still Panets in Montreal, uh, and I wondered if they come from the same family. Okay, I haven't met any Panet yet, but I have uh, met uh, a Chose Gros de in Quebec. They're still in engineering. <laughs> and uh, I met quite a few members of the family of uh, De Lodbinière Harwood who are celebrating the uh, Seigneurial in Vaudreuil. Uh, that will start in a few weeks. And uh, the descendant move, come from Toronto to attend the, uh, the Seigneurial. Thank you. Uh, the Panets I know in Montreal are actually Panet Raymond, which is the same as your last name. So maybe you're part of the heritage of the... <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, I met uh, that gentleman um, for the Panet part, perhaps, but for the Raymond part, my, the ancestor who gave me my name was Jean-Baptiste Bertrand, dit Toulouse, when he was in the Navy uh, troops. And when he got demobilized, he was now in the militia and got against all the rules by changing his nickname to become Raymond, which is the first name of his father. And uh, the name changed in 1766. And I suspect that he was asked, what your surname? And he gave them his surnom, uh -huh. which is a nickname, not a, a family name. Yes. And that's perhaps how the nickname became the family name. Thank you. Thank you again. Welcome. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, Mr. questions? Mr. Campbell. Oh, yes, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Campbell, uh, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, and... yeah I'm wondering, uh, one of the photographs had a picture of a photograph of a Martello Tower uh, yeah. that looked pretty much identical to the Martello Tower in Fort Frederick and uh, in, in Kingston. And there too, there's a couple, there's another Martello Tower in Kingston. Who who built the, the Martello Towers in Kingston? Do, do, do you that's, know? Uh, that's another engineer who followed Briay. Briay died in 1814. The Martello Tower at the Royal Military College or in Fort, Fort Frederick uh, was built uh, several years later. And uh, the officer could be John By, who worked for Briay before working on the canal, uh, okay. on the Rideau Canal. And uh, he did quite a few work around, and the, you, 
remember that the Rideau Canal end up in, in, in uh, Kingston. And uh, it's quite possible it's him who built the Martello Tower uh, in Kingston and followed the, the step of uh, Bruyère by having a roof on top of the tower. Uh, usually, for if you go to if you go to Portugal, all the towers have no roof. But in Quebec, <laughs> you have water infiltrating and a freezing, unfreezing process that destroy masonry. There's a cadet in, in 1953 and 57, uh, that tower did not have a, a, a roof on it, but uh, the, a roof was added uh, in, somewhere maybe 10, 10 years later or so because of, this, of the water problem. But uh, I suppose it might have originally built, been built with the roof, but the roof maybe had been removed at some point, then they replaced it. Yeah, for sure, the, that, uh, when you finish the work, there was no roof because they were expecting to be attacked by the American force. And when you attack, you don't put a roof. It's a fire hazard. So, so the roof that was put up in maybe the 60s, it was probably the first time it had a roof. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, well, in, in closing, Monsieur Ramon, I'd like to thank you very much for presenting the history of this incredible family whose uh, threads uh, intertwine through at least six countries. I may have missed a country or two, but uh, it, they're it, sure to win the war. They have people in every army of the time. Yeah, <laughs> yes, but that means they lose every war as well. So it's, uh, but it's that was that was absolutely, that was absolutely marvelous and and an amazing contribution. To, to Canadian history. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you everybody for attending. Uh, is there, I'm, I, I have master of ceremony duties, so I'll thank everybody and we'll see you on the next presentation. Thank you for tonight.